Okay, now it's recording and we can start, right? So today we are going to talk about uh, asynchronous programming. This topic will uh, um, take, uh, uh, I think, a couple of um, lectures. I mean, not just today, but next week. You remember this, uh, the, the actual schedule of the course is already it's always actually available here on the course homepage. So always refer to the schedule here. I, I won't make too many announcements on the on the Telegram just to not to you know pollute too much the Telegram. But uh, I mean you, you can always check here. Yeah, today is Monday, okay? So we have lecture today. There's the first lab tomorrow, okay? Uh, my colleague Antonio will come. I will update this uh, today okay so there will be my colleague there will be my colleague Antonio in the lab for the whole uh, three hours each one of you is supposed to be in just one group okay according to the division that we made in the slides the first uh, day means A to L and then M to Z or Z and um, I mean it's not uh, so rigid uh, if you really want to change the group, it's fine, but you, you've, saw, uh, you've seen the room, it's room um, 10E, so it's not uh, as big as this one, and so we cannot uh, really accommodate everybody, especially in a lab where we need to go around and uh, help uh, people, okay? And then, remember, Thursday, no lecture for this week, and then today I will publish the schedule for the next week and so on, okay? So we don't have to fill up all the slots. Would be nice, but it would be you know ten or twelve uh, uh, credits course. So <laughs> it's not fair for you. Um, okay. So let's start. And this is one of the most important topics uh, that we need to learn in JavaScript. Okay because uh, uh, JavaScript supports asynchronous programming very well, that's one point, but also the browser environment, so our web application, will mostly work with asynchronous programming. Why? Because it interacts with, uh, with the user, with the people using the browser and clicking and using your application. So everything that will be run uh, in terms of code will be um, so it started by an asynchronous interaction. So we need to understand how to write asynchronous code, okay? So this is the topic of this uh, big uh, block of uh, slides, okay? That will uh, um, take us for today and uh, lecture next week, okay? Uh, okay, so that's just the outline today. In short, we will talk about uh, more or less the first two points. We'll see if we have some time for the third uh, as well, okay? But the rest uh, will be done next week. Um, so, first of all, callbacks. Well, actually, we already talked uh, uh, about uh, uh, functions in JavaScript. You understood that this is a very important element in JavaScript. Functions are objects. There is code that can be executed, which is uh, connected to this object, um, and uh, uh, um, functions can be passed around, so you can um, um, pass as uh, the function as a parameter or to another function, you can return the function as the return value of another function, and you remember this uh, caused us a, a few issues, I don't want to call them problems, but issues, you know, the closure the scope that was already available uh, in, in, the, um, in the function that you then return from another function, and the scope that was visible to the function that you return is still available to the function. That's a closure. Remember last week, okay? And so the fact that you have this uh, object that represents a function that you can pass around uh, means that you have uh, a lot of programming possibilities, especially in terms of uh, writing asynchronous code. That means code that will be executed in a different moment and a different time with respect to when it is executed, the code that uses this function uh, in terms of parameters, return value, and so on. Okay? 
So the first way of using this, uh, um, this uh, programming style is uh, to create callback functions. They are just standard functions. Everything is a standard function. There's no difference for JavaScript in terms of what is a callback uh, uh, and so on, okay? Or, or a method, etc. Because they are just references to objects of type function for JavaScript. But we call them callbacks just to remember, um, to remind us that uh, those functions will be called by somebody else, so called back by somebody else. So typically, the code uh, of the function to which we pass the reference to the function, to the callback. So let's, let's look at the example. So I have a function, log quote, very simple function just for examples, right? So a, a function that prints something, okay? That prints what is passed here, quote, okay? And we pass this function log quote as a parameter, second parameter, to another function create quote that here I wrote myself in the example. But this could be a library function, uh, uh, some, some function that somebody else wrote, like in a package, in the DGS packaging, SQLite package, whatever package that you use in your project. Okay, so you pass the reference to the function here, log what that you wrote yourself to do some kind of behavior, to implement some kind of behavior. And the function that receives the, the one that you wrote uses it. How can it use it? Uh, it takes the, the reference, which is actually the parameter to that uh, function, open the bracket, and then use it, it uh, according to what it's expected um, uh, from you for using the function. Here you define a function that expects one parameter, so the function that receives the callback will call it with one parameter. If you wrote it yourself, you know that you know, the, the, the function that you wrote has just one parameter and you call it with one parameter. If this function has been mm, written by somebody else, so it's a library function, you look, it, uh, you look the, uh, at the manual and check what, what are the parameters that the callback should take, okay? Think about the sort function. Think, yes, the sort function. This is in the next slide. The sort function takes a callback, so a function that is expected to take two parameters, the two references or values to compare, okay? Well, actually values, if you look at the manual. So the values to compare, and it is expected to return a value which is positive, zero, or negative, depending on how the two uh, values compare, okay? So you can define your own behavior in the comparison, which is the key uh, operation of the sort function, okay? But to, you don't have to implement a whole sort function code. Okay, yeah. let's hope everything is fine. <laughs> okay, um, so this is the idea of the callback. It's common in also other languages, uh, like for instance, sort uh, function in many other languages behaves in this way. In C, you can pass a pointer to a function which expects a couple of parameters, in Python as well, in Java as well, and so on, okay? So the idea of a callback is very simple, okay? Pass a reference to a function to be executed when it's needed by the function to which I, po I pass the callback. So let's go back to this example. Of course, here, create what is mine, but uh, in the second one, sort is implemented by somebody else, okay? Uh, there are two types of callbacks, a synchronous and asynchronous. Actually, again, this is just uh, a reference for us to clarify our ideas. For JavaScript, there's actually no difference, okay? So we will look uh, first at synchronous uh, functions, okay, callbacks, because they are simpler, of course. And then we will look at the synchronous later, okay? So the function that we pass here in the sort is actually a synchronous function, uh, a synchronous callback. Why? Because you when, when the sort function calls this function, waits, uh, waits for the function to terminate the execution. So this operation is really simple. So it means that when the, the sort has to compare a couple of values, 
it calls this callback. So in this case, this arrow function or this function is the same. The function executes the code and the sort waits until waits until uh, uh, the, the the computation is performed. So the difference is performed. Okay, this is very simple, of course, just a, a math operation, but uh, it could be more complex code. Okay, so this is a synchronous callback. Why? Because uh, uh, the sort calls the callback and then waits uh, for the termination of the callback. Each time it is needed. Okay, each time you call, uh, the sort calls uh, the callback. Okay, okay, so. This is very interesting because, of course, a sort works in this way. Why you can, let's say, um, uh, tailor the behavior of the sort uh, in the way you like, like for ascending, descending order, and so on. But you can also make more complex things, like uh, sorting objects, uh, for instance, or filtering objects, and so on. Okay? If you have a, a more complex uh, um, element to sort, and th this is common to other languages as well, like C, Python, and so on. You can sort uh, uh, an array containing uh, different types of objects. I mean, uh, in the sense that they are homogeneous because you need to sort them, so, so it makes sense if they are homogeneous, but uh, uh, they don't have to be a certain type. It can be numbers, strings, uh, reference to objects, and so on. Okay? Like, uh, have a look at this example. Uh, market. Actually, it's an array for JavaScript because we open the square brackets. And then there are three objects. Why objects? Because we open the curly bracket here. So every time we open a curly bracket, we create a new object, right? There are uh, two properties in the object, name and bar. So this is uh, just stock market, so the name of the stock and uh, variation price, where so you can put whatever you like here. Just an example. And of course, uh, I mean, since you want to sort uh, those objects, it's better that, uh, I mean, you actually need that uh, they contain the same uh, properties, right? Because uh, if you are looking to sort on something, uh, you need to have this property in any object. Like you, you, you want to sort or filter on, yeah, this is the variation. If you don't have the var property in the object, what are you going to sort on. So, <laughs> of course, you need uh, this, uh, this property. But the rest can be anything, actually. Uh, JavaScript doesn't really care. Why? Because the callback that then you pass just want to access the property named var in this case. Actually, we should choose a better name, var. Var doesn't uh, really, is not related to the var keyword, okay? It's just a property we define, like name and so on, okay? Anyway. Variation, let's call it variation, okay? So, uh, in JavaScript, uh, in the standard library especially, there's plenty of uh, uh, JavaScript functions uh, that takes callbacks as parameter. Why? Because in this way, it's easy to have uh, a, a behavior that is specified by the programmer, not the li by the library itself. Like, uh, we, I think we already saw this filter somewhere in the example maybe. Um, anyway, uh, uh, the array in JavaScript has a number of uh, uh, properties. Some of them are actually methods. That means properties uh, that contain a reference to a function that can be called. So this uh, property filter can be called because it's a reference to a function. You open uh, the, the bracket and then you can pass a callback, okay? This is actually a function. Uh, a function just defined here from the open to the closed bracket, okay? W in, in terms of, uh, uh, in the format actually of the arrow function, that's why it's so convenient because you save, you know, the function keyword, uh, oops, as before, uh, you know, the, the code hopefully is more readable if the things that you need to do in this callback is simple, okay? So, like, uh, this is very simple to understand. Uh, that's a callback that takes uh, the object stock, okay? We can put any name here. Uh, that's the name of the parameter of the function that we are going to pass to filter. So, let's choose a name, like stock. 
Well, uh, arrow, it means that we define the body, the code of the function, and then we return a value that is uh, if the var property of stock is uh, less than zero, that's true, otherwise it's false. This is a JavaScript expression. That's a Boolean expression because it's a comparison. It's the same thing that you would write inside the if, okay? You could, you could write, uh, no, if stock bar le uh, less than zero return uh, true, else return false, okay? But this is more compact way of, you know, of writing this thing. But this should be quite clear, okay? And this is actually the return value. Remember the arrow functions, if they're just a single expression, this is the return value of the arrow function. So we'll, we are rehearsing, uh, reviewing the, the function definition in JavaScript. Okay? If you open the brackets here, the curly brackets, you need to specify return. But it's um, more cumbersome, so we don't do that. Um, and so what does the filter do? Well, actually, here I can tell you, but uh, uh, otherwise you go to the manual like the MDN, Mozilla Developer Network, you check the manual, the instructions, and, and see what the, does the filter do. And actually, the filter uh, does uh, what I'm going to say now. So basically, it iterates over the array on which it's called, so this uh, market, market is an array, iterates on every element, there are three elements, and for each element calls the callback. And if the callback returns true, it puts, it to, it puts the, uh, the, the value, uh, the element that is processing into a new array, okay? If it returns false, it just skip it. So the filter always create a new array and it creates a new array that contains only the elements for which the callback returns true. Let's see the example. We have three elements here. We want the uh, elements that have a stock dot var, so the property var less than zero. And in the end, if you execute this code, you will get a, an array that has two, uh, two elements, which are two references to two objects which are actually the same object as before. And uh, they have variation with the negative value, okay? If you are in doubt, uh, they are the same object as before or not, just take this simple code and execute it into the Python tutor, okay? And you'll see the arrows pointing to the same object. Why? Because uh, that's how the filter works. The filter just copy the value of the array into the new array. And the value for non-primitive values, so for objects and so on, is just a reference. So it copies the reference. The reference is the same, so the object is the same. Okay? And of course, you can do the opposite as well and, and see what happens. Okay? So just, uh, uh, well, let's see if we have time. Uh, yes, let's try. I think it's the uh, last time in the, in, the, in the course we use this uh, Python tutor, but uh, let's uh, have a look. Uh, copy, I didn't open the Python tutor, I hope it works. Yes, JavaScript. Come on. Uh, new strict, strict, uh, never forget it. It's true they are simple, simple examples, okay? So that's, that's what happens. You see the arrows, uh, there's uh, the market, that's the original array, and then there's this uh, new array, and you see there are arrows to the same objects, okay? You can go back and forth, but, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter, okay? Because actually the, 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 the sort fun no the filter function is not executed step by step by thing. Yeah. So if you are in doubt to just check it in the Python tutor. Okay? But the rule is very simple. Anything that is not a primitive type, that means numbers, strings, booleans, and null undefined, is a reference. And so if you copy a reference, what is pointed by the reference stays the same, 
Okay? Good. So, uh, let's proceed and uh, um, have a look at um, a programming paradigm, which is not really peculiar to JavaScript, but JavaScript is really well suited for this programming paradigm. So, what is a, paradigm, a programming paradigm? Actually, it's a way of programming, okay? a way of writing code. This is a, a functional programming paradigm. So, in short, uh, uh, the idea is uh, we, we want to write our code when possible. Okay? It's not always possible, but many times it's possible in an easy way. Um, we want to write a code um, achieving our results basically by um, combining functions. And to tell how the functions work, we pass to those functions other functions, so the callbacks that I just talked about. Okay? So it's a more declarative style rather than imperative style. You know, the imperative style is what you learned uh, wh when you started programming. So they told you, well, you declare a variable and then you decide and if you want a choice, that's an if, if you want to have a, a loop uh, that's a for or while and so on, you decide which is the condition that stops the loop, et cetera, et cetera, okay? This is imperative style. So basically you say for every uh, new clock cycle, so every time the, the CPU can, instru can, can uh, execute a new instruction, uh, you tell the CPU what to do in short, okay? That's imperative. Now you do this and then that and so on, okay? With functional programming, of course, it's more abstract. You basically declare what you would like to do. Like, I want a new array, and uh, um, I want a new array to be filtered on this condition. And the condition is the filter function, like we saw before, OK? Uh, in a certain sense, it could also improve readability. But of course, not uh, uh, all the code that we, we, we would like to write is, is suitable for this approach, okay? At least in JavaScript. But many times uh, that's uh, something um, that can be really useful. Because many times, like in the web uh, applications, you have to filter things, for instance. You have to sort things. You have to reduce things to single values and so on. And this is, these are the basic operations that we are going to see now. Okay? Compare the functional programming approach, that is the one that we just saw also in the previous slide, to the, let's say, traditional imperative one. So uh, in, in the traditional approach, the imperative approach, we will say, well, we want a new array. Well, first we need to define the array, empty array, and then we need to iterate over the whole array and uh, decide uh, if the element in the array is to be kept or not. So do we want to keep it? Yes or no? If we keep it, uh, we need to add it to, to the new array. So new array push and so on. Okay? You remember push adds in the end of the array, at the end of the array. So if you see the code on the right, you need to read it, understand it, and try to guess what, what, what is uh, trying to do, okay? You read the code on the left, of course, you should know what the filter function uh, does, but uh, I mean, this typically is simple, okay? Functions uh, have uh, good uh, names and are typically library functions. And so you want a new array, uh, all these functions will see returns a new uh, array, and there's a function that decides if you want to keep the element or not. And the rest is implemented inside the filter, so the loop and so on. You don't have to implement it. It's already implemented in the, in the function. Okay, so before seeing some, before, before going to some examples, uh, uh, these are some uh, notable features of the functional programming approach. Well, first, you need to have a good support for functions because you need to pass them as uh, parameters uh, to other functions, okay? So uh, we say JavaScript is very well suited for this because uh, since the beginning it was born with, uh, you know, the function object because uh, they, they, they wanted to have uh, 
code attached to events, so basically functions were really flexible you know, since the beginning. And then you have higher order function, so a function that operates on other functions, so taking one or more functions as argument, it typically return a new function, okay? Uh, yeah, this is more uh, theoretical approach. What is more interesting for us is that you can typically compose functions, so put one function after the other because each time you um, uh, return an output that then can be chained with the rest of the other functional, um, um, I mean, of the functions that are available in this functional programming paradigm. So, um, in short, you want to write uh, uh, functions that do uh, a, a job that is common and then can be reused in different contexts depending on the callback that you pass, like the filter, like the sort, and so on, okay? Uh, and then you can change a chain all the calls because uh, uh, this, again, improves readability. Let's take an array, let's filter for what is interesting to us, and then let's sort, and then let's map uh, extracting whatever we would like to extract from uh, uh, the object and so on, okay? We are going to see examples now, okay? Uh, functional programming, the functional programming approach requires uh, avoiding mutability. So we try not to modify, actually we should not modify, the data that is passed to the functions, like the array, the original array. We don't want to modify the original array, okay? We want to return a new array. With the references to the object, that's fine, but a new array. Every time we apply a function, we return a new array, okay? Uh, why? Otherwise, this kind of approach uh, might not work, okay? Because uh, if you also go on and, and modify the original array, it means uh, that uh, you're not returning a new array, you're returning the original one, and if you want to change all the things, uh, things might break at a certain point. Okay, so let's have a look at the most uh, useful functions in the functional programming paradigm or style in, uh, in JavaScript. Well, um, another additional way of iterating over an array. An array, each array in JavaScript uh, um, makes uh, this method available. So you can write array dot for each and pass a callback. Okay, so if you want to do something on each array, you can do, of course, the for of, the for with the index and whatever you like, but also you have this for each, but you need to pass a function here. So it's, I would say, it maybe it's more readable, hopefully it's more readable, okay? So for each says, uh, okay, for each element of the array, perform this operation. The operation is what is, uh, uh, specified by the callback. Then you have uh, other iterators like uh, um, for uh, each element of the array you check if each element satisfy what is specified by the callback f or only some of them satisfy the callback. And of course in this case the callback must return a boolean value because you need to know if yes or no, satisfy or not satisfy the condition. Uh, iterators that return a new array, this is much more, this is the more useful ones. Okay, you can, the, we, can, we will try to use them in the example in the second part of the lecture. So there, there are two functions that construct and return a new array. One, we already saw it, it said filter, and the second is the map, okay? And then you have this uh, operator which is quite, uh, uh, let's say, uh, s specific, <laughs> okay, uh, peculiar, reduce. Uh, so basically you pass a callback. Where's the callback? Yes, here. So the first parameter is the callback, which takes a number of parameters. Uh, and this callback will be called on all the elements of the array, 
but the purpose is to reduce all the elements to, of the array to a single value. Okay, and value in JavaScript means anything, like objects, but typically a value. Like, think in terms of, uh, you have a, a, an array of numbers, and you want to reduce everything to a single number, maybe the sum of the number, the average of the number, and so on. Okay, that's the example we are going to see. Uh, for each one of these functions, there's a slide that specifies how to use it. So, deck for each invokes, so calls your synchronous callback function once for each element of an iterable object. So in short, you can use it uh, on arrays, but not only on arrays, there are other uh, objects in JavaScript which are iterable, and typically the other objects that you often use are strings, basically. They, they are not actually arrays of objects because they are primitive type, but they behave in, some, in a certain way, like uh, arrays for some aspect, like if you need to you know, um, uh, iterate over the single characters and so on, okay? So let's have a look. Letters for each, and uh, for each letter in, in this, well, actually here they, they, they made it an array, okay? I think you, you can use it on strings as well. We, we can check. Uh, I have doubt now. <laughs> anyway, uh, we start with, the let, uh, we, with an array. Be why? Because the spread operator transforms uh, what is given to, to it in an array in any case, okay? So it's an array of strings of length one, but it's an array of string, strings. And letters for each, and we call it a callback. Actually, the for each calls the callback for us for each element in the array. And we can do anything we like in this, uh, um, uh, in this uh, callback. Uh, for instance, we can process the parameters, so it means uh, the element of the letters, so the, ar the element of the array, and do operations like uh, to uppercase, make it uh, uppercase, and then do whatever you like, uh, add to another um, array or an object. In this case, um, well, a string. In this case, it's a string. You can add a, a, a string at the end of another string, and you have the concatenation of the two strings. And then see the results, okay? Just for us for, to understand what's happening. Uh, it's a way of iterating of an array, okay? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's um, interesting, but uh, I mean, we have uh, many other ways of iterating over an array if you really need it. Okay, so the for each invokes uh, your s callback, which is synchronous in the sense that the for each waits for the execution of the callback uh, each time it is called. And the callback, how should behave? The callback takes uh, up to three parameters. So current value, so the element of the array, as we saw in the previous example, so it's an arrow function. We are only used one parameter in the callback. That's fine. But you know, the others uh, don't create problem. In JavaScript, you can have a, 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 a function which has three parameters and call it the function with just one, no errors. What do the other elements uh, uh, get in, in, uh, in terms of value. If they are specified, they are undefined. If they are not specified, no, if they are not specified, they are undefined. Otherwise, they take the, the value that is passed by who is calling the function. And um, so it can take a second parameter uh, index. That's the index in the array. So it starts from 0, 0, 1, 2, and so on. Okay, and also the reference to the array. Sometimes it's useful because in this kind of way of writing the code, you don't have uh, really access, uh, you know, to the index, for instance. If you write uh, the for and, and you write a for like let i equals to zero, i uh, less than i plus plus, of course you have i, but I here, where, where's the index? Let's say, uh, I would like to do a different thing depending on the index, on the even and odd indexes. I would like to do different things. 
if I don't have the index, I cannot really use this approach, okay? So to make the method more flexible, in addition to the current value in the array, you get the index and also the array as well. Why? Because you typically would like to know the length, okay? The length while uh, calling the callback each time, okay? Uh, remember that the callback, uh, uh, no, so not the callback, sorry, the for each returns undefined is one of the functions that cannot be changed, chained with others, so put into a chain, so in a sequence with others. And also, it's a bit different from the standard for of the JavaScript uh, uh, language because there's no way to stop or break the for each. So you cannot say, you cannot write here uh, break okay, in the callback. It won't work. It will not work. Okay? If you really want to break, you need to do the for by yourself. For off, for etc. Okay? The only way it, bro it breaks is throwing an exception that the code so becomes complicated and probably you lose the advantage of using the for each, so nobody uses uh, the for each in this way, okay? Okay, note that the for each does not mutate the array on which it is called, so that's why we included it here in the functional programming paradigm, but actually the callback might have side effects, so it might... Uh, uh, modify the array, but this is not recommended actually, because if you modify an array while you are iterating over the array, typically you create problems, <laughs> okay, because it gets shorter or longer and you never know when, when you're going to finish the iteration, okay? Um, okay, let's have a look at the other two, every and some. Every test whether all the elements in the array pass the test, and the test is a callback. You call the, uh, the, the every calls the callback for each element and gets the value, boolean, true or false. Uh, converting it if necessary, as every time uh, happens in JavaScript. So if it's true to your falsy. Okay, we don't really need a boolean. It's better if we have boolean because uh, the code is clearer, but uh, uh, if it's not boolean, it will be converted in boolean with the truthy, falsy rules. And uh, um, this every executes the callback once for each element until it finds the one where the callback returns a falsy value. So let's say I would like to check if every element, and that's why it's called every, if every element in the array is less than 10, okay? So uh, you use the array and you call every, and you pass a callback that returns uh, true if less than 10, and this will check all the elements of the array, and in the end it will return true, okay? Otherwise, if we put less than 3, let's say, it will return false. Okay, because when it, it arrives to three, it says three less than three, no, that's false, and it doesn't make sense to go on in the array, so it stops the loop of, over the array, and it just simply returns false, okay? This is another example, this is the modulo operator, so it's the, integer divi the, the rest of the integer division, okay? If the number is, uh, if all numbers are uh, even, and of course this is not the case. And some test whether at least one element in the array passes the test. So in the other case, every, and here uh, one is enough. Okay? There is a, at least one element that is uh, um, even, yes. So this will return true. And you can pass functions that takes parameters. Uh, you know, uh, that are also not created by you, okay? So like is none, it's a, a library function uh, that is available in JavaScript, and you can check if uh, uh, there are some none uh, value, not a number value in the array, okay? So if you pass the reference, that's actually the same of defining a callback. Here, yeah, we are defining the callback because we need to write the code. But actually what is expected as parameter of these functions for a callback, it's a reference to a function. So if the function already exists, it's enough to specify the name. The name is actually the reference to the function, okay? 
Of course, it, it needs to, uh, um, in some ways, uh, fulfill the characteristic of the callback that is expected. So take uh, at least one parameter that is the element. So if none, we'll take one parameter, fine, and we'll return something uh, true or false, or something that can be converted to true or false. But anything can be converted to true or false with the truthy, falsy rules in JavaScript. Okay? Oh, let's come to the more interesting ones. So map, uh, filter, and then reduce, okay? You will use this ones uh, a lot. Why? Because again, in, in web applications, you will have a list of elements to show to the user, okay? And those are arrays in JavaScript. And to process those arrays, you'll see that this way of proceeding will be very, very convenient, okay? So map passes each element of the array which it is, invoke, is invoked, and the callback returns a value, and the value is put into a new array. Okay? Map always returns a new array, containing the values returned by the callback. Let's have a look. Const A, 1, 2, 3, that's the array. B, A, map, and the callback returns a value. Actually, the value is the squared uh, squared value, so uh, the element multiplied by itself, okay? So first time maps, map uh, um, calls the callback on one, so the callback performs the operation one times one, the result is one, that's the return value, the map takes the return value and put it into a new array, okay? In the same position. So first element will produce the result for the first uh, position of the new array, second element for the second element, and so on. So two, two times two, that's four, and three times three, it's nine, okay? That's very simple stuff. I mean, uh, you, could, you could always do these things in another way, like with the four off and so on. But sometimes it's convenient to write this kind of code. Why? Because that's a simple instruction. It's not a code for which you have to open brackets uh, and so on and write a code, etc. You'll see that when we, pro we are programming in JavaScript environment for web applications, sometimes it's very convenient to have expression that directly returns what you are expecting. Instead of opening brackets and wrote code, uh, which uh, uh, reduces the readability of the code, or calling functions, or calling code which is written somewhere, somewhere else in your file, and so it's difficult to follow because you need to go to the code and come back to the place where you are. Yes, there's a question. This uh, isn't this the same f um, as the, the same as for each? You say it. It, it iterates over all elements, that's true. And the difference is that for each, doesn't return a new array, but returns undefined. While the map, we always return a new array, and the array is the same size of the array that you, uh, that you used in the call, okay? So that's the difference, okay? So it's true that more or less does the same as the for each, so it takes the call back and uh, run the callback on each element of the array. But one doesn't return anything, so it's basically a for where you are free to do whatever you like, okay? And here, instead, what you return is um, uh, what is to be put in the new array, okay? And so typically here, you don't want to have side effects or, thing, or strange things in the callback because you are you are writing something that should be put into the new array, okay? While in the for each, you are free to do whatever you like, okay? Like here, you see letters, letters map, so actually that's an array of uh, strings uh, of length one, so H, E, L, L, and so on. So for each string, so for each element of the array, so for each string, map letter, letter to uppercase, and that's the return value, remember, because of the arrow function notation, okay? Because write return letter to uppercase, 
And in the end, you will end up with an array of strings, which are one character long strings. And they are still an array. And then there's another useful method on, on arrays that is useful especially for debugging, actually. Uh, sometimes for programming is fine, but uh, I mean for debugging because you have an array, typically an array of uh, single letter strings. You want to print it. Uh, well, let's join all the elements of the array using in the middle an empty string. So basically it creates a new string that has all the elements of the array uh, attached together. Okay? Uh, fine. So that's then we have the filter. We already saw the filter. Creates a new array, again, with all the elements, but only the elements that pass the test of the callback function. The callback function now is not creating a new value, but it's a test, Boolean, true or false. If it's true, it's kept. If it's false, it's discarded. OK? Um, if no elements passes the test, an empty array is returned. So it's no, uh, there's no error in this case. I mean, uh, worst case, we have an empty array, OK? But you remember the empty array is not uh, a, 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 a false value and so on. So it doesn't really create problems in JavaScript. OK, just an empty array. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, filter x uh, less than 3. So we will we'll end up with 2 and 1 because we put uh, less then. If we say less uh, or equal, OK, less than or equal, we will have 3 to 1 and so on. We want to filter on the position of the elements in the array. We can do that, OK? Uh, why? Because the callback that we pass to the filter is called with the three parameters, as in this case. We should could be more specific uh, in this slide, OK? So current value, that's the index, and then that's the array, OK? If, oh, th this also applies to the map. We will see an example for this. Um, so if we don't specify the second and third parameter, we just ignore those parameters. They are set. If we specify them, we can use it. But if they are not set, it's not an error for JavaScript to call a function with three parameters and call a function defined as a function that takes one parameter. This is a, a kind of magic of JavaScript. Okay? When we need them, we specify them. If we don't need them, we can also non, not specify them. So the second element is the index. So actually, we are not filtering on the value of the element, but just on the position. And the position will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 starting from zero. So if the reminder of the division by two, so the rest, from maybe I say the rest, uh, the reminder, actually, that's the correct word. Reminder of division by two is zero, means it's an even position. Yes. Uh, zero is an even position. So the first position is even because it's zero. Remember, vector starts from zero. So the reminder of zero Divided by 2 is 0, so it's fine. It's true, so we take it. Second position is 1. 1 divided by 2 creates a, a reminder of 1. So it's not 0, so it's not included. Position 2 is included, and position 4 is included. So it's 5, 3, 1. OK? So you can also use indexes if needed. OK? That's a powerful. The, the power of this method, OK? And let's come to the last example, OK? Uh, and last function, and then an example. Reduce. Well, reduce, com uh, it's a bit different from the rest, because as I told you, combines the element of an array and uh, specifies, uh, um, uh, uses a function specified to produce a single, single value, OK? Any type of values, fine, but typically numbers, but this is not really required. Uh, this is a common operation in functional programming, goes by the name of inject and fold. So first you map the data that you have, so you process each one of them in some ways, and then you combine them, fold them, 
into a single value. That's more or less the same approach that Google introduced uh, quite a number of years ago, map reduce, that's why the name. You know, first you elaborate uh, your, your data and then you reduce your uh, data to single value, so you, let's say, get some insight in the data, okay? But here it's much simpler, you can do whatever you like depending on what you pass as a callback. Uh, this function takes two arguments. Second is optional, the first is mandatory because without the callback we cannot do anything. And the callback is a function that takes f up to four parameters. First is um, a, a value that is the value in which the re final result will be progressively computed, okay? And this will be passed by reduce to us, to our callback. We don't have to define this accumulator. We don't have to do let accumulator and so on. This is done by the reduce. It's something that is passed to the callback. And then the current value of the array, okay? And then the index and the array, but they are optional in case we need them, okay? Um, and then there's an option, an initial value to pass to the function. So this accumulator, if we want an initial value, so a, a first value to be passed to our callback, we can specify it here. Otherwise, there will be a default value, I think uh, zero or something like this. We should check on the manual. I don't remember, but I think it's zero. So let's see an example because it, it, it's simpler to, to reason on an, on an example. First example just computes the sum of the elements in the array. So think of the basic operation if you want to sum the elements in an array. What are you going to do? You are taking a variable where you store the partial sum until now in the array, and that's the actual accumulator that we called before. And then you have the current value of the, uh, um, of the array in the array, the, the value that you are processing, and what you are going to do. Well, actually, you want to return the sum of the accumulator, so what you have summed until now, and the new value. That, that's what you do in a for off or in a for loop. So you have a, a sum equal to zero in the beginning, and then you add each time the new element, and in the end, in sum, there will be the result. Here, that's the same, that's the accumulator, which in the beginning here, I set to zero. I tell the reduce function to use zero as the first, uh, at the, as the um, uh, starting value. And then each time I take the accumulator and I sum it to the current value. Where is the accumulator stored? It's stored somewhere in the reduce function, okay? So it's not my problem, it's a reduce function problem. Uh, I don't have to define it. The function will define it for me and will pass it to me, to my callback, each time the callback is called, okay? And I can do whatever I want with this uh, accumulator value, okay? So the first parameter to reduce, be careful, the first parameter starts here from the definition of the callback and the definition of the callback ends here to the, in the comma. Okay, because we have parameters and the code of the function. Comma, that's the second parameter of the reduce. The same applies in, in the next lines, like here. See, the first is the callback and the second is the initial value. First is the callback and the second is not specified here. Okay, because it's optional, right? So let's see uh, uh, two other examples. Uh, just to show you how to use this reduce, um, I know it might not be so intuitive as the other ones. The other ones are very easy to understand. Filter, it filters the elements of the array. The map, it converts the elements of the array. Reduce, also is less useful sometimes, uh, and it's a bit less intuitive. You need to think in terms of, um, you know, single iterations of the loop and specify the code that can work in that single iteration in the callback. Let's, see, let's say we want the product of all the values in the array. 
Well, each time the accumulator will contain the partial product, so the product until now, right? We just need to be careful because if we multiply something by zero in the beginning, of course, we get zero in the end. So we need to start by multiplying uh, um, by one, not by zero. Well, when we are summing and we want the sum, the neutral element is zero, so we start summing from zero, right? But we can also do you know, more complex thing, like uh, finding the maximum in the array. In this case, this ACK, the accumulator, actually, uh, it's the variable that we would use in this uh, for iteration to compute the maximum. So it's the current maximum, okay? You start with the current maximum and you check if the current element is greater than the maximum, you change the maximum, otherwise you keep the maximum as it is. So uh, that's exactly what the callback is, dying, is doing here. So you get this accumulator and current value. If the accumulator is greater than the val current value, the accumulator is still the maximum. And that's we, what we return to the reduce to use it as the accumulator in the next iteration on the array, in the next call to our callback. Or we, use, uh, we return val, val, so the value, because the value is greater than the accumulator. So it's a new maximum. And in the end, in the accumulator, there will be the maximum. And in the end, the return, uh, the reduce returns uh, the value of the accumulator, okay? Uh, I think uh, here the default value is, is uh, yeah, Z, or maybe it's undefined, I don't know. We should check in the manual, okay? This should work in any case. So this is a summary of the methods. Uh, that we mm, discussed, well, actually the, there are a, a few more, but you see the map and the filter and the reduce, okay? Those are the three basic methods that we will use mostly. So map, what does map do? Takes elements in the array and convert them, process them in some ways. Let's say they were squared, you get the same number of elements, but in a different shape. Okay, that's the idea. I mean, they are objects, we can remove property, we can add properties, we can do something on the objects, but we get the same number of objects. The filter, we exclude the elements we don't like. Let's say we want to filter for the squared, okay, we'll get only squared elements. So the only the elements that are uh, satisfying the property that we specify in the callback. Uh, well, that's a find, okay. Find index, it, the, it will tell us the index, okay, instead of the element. That's fine. Uh, well, fill, we, we saw it, okay. Sum and every, they return Boolean value. And reduce, reduce in some ways combine everything, okay, according to our rules. So there's no real nice graphical representation except for saying, well, in some ways, it's everything combined together, okay? So this is just uh, some nice graphic to remember things. Let's have a look at more complex example, and um, yeah, and then uh, we'll see what to do. Th this, uh, we will try this example uh, together. Okay, so first, uh, let's read this example. So we have an array an array which is a bit more complex than the example with the stocks. So, oops. Um, let's say we have vehicles, so uh, objects uh, uh, that have uh, quite a number of properties, okay? Uh, make, model, type, price, okay? So three strings and a number. So there are cars, let's say, or SUVs, uh, as it says, yeah. Uh, a bit older, but anyway. Um, and that's the same thing that will happen to you when you have your web application. You will have objects representing elements into a, in a list of something that you need to display on, on, the, on the page, okay? So for now, they are very simple because you need something that we can understand. But basically, the properties will be references to elements in the page <laughs> and so on, okay? And let's say here there are 10, yeah, 10 objects. So 10 elements in the array. Remember each object is independent of the others because JavaScript treats objects in this way, okay? But 
since we want some code which is useful, typically we have arrays that contains uh, the same type of objects. So for us, type means uh, the same properties, right? Because uh, I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't really make sense to have, uh, uh, you know, vehicles and no no manufacturer. What, what does it mean? No price. And so what, what are we going to do if there's no price and so on? Okay. Okay, so we have this, uh, let's say, complex data structure. So an array of objects with uh, some many properties. And we would like to take out um, uh, the average price of all the cars which are of type SUV. And type SUV means a property that we define in our object. We call some cars SUVs, otherwise trucks, sedan, whatever you like, okay? Uh, of course, we can always program, let's say, in a very traditional way. Uh, so if you are uh, programming in C, well, you don't have object. Let's say Python, okay? You have Python, you say for, and you iterate over the elements in the vehicle, and you say if type equal to SUV, then you would like to compute the average. So you say sum equal to sum plus the price, and then you have a counter, or in some ways, yeah, you need to have the counter because you need to know how, how many SUVs are there. So there's a counter, counter plus one, and in the end, you take the, the sum and you divide by the counter and you get the average price only for the type SUV because you put an if somewhere in the loop. That's a traditional approach. Nothing wrong with that, but uh, you see, we can write everything in a single line, actually not really a single line because slides are big, but if you have a code, okay, at least in a single expression. So you don't really need to write uh, um, uh, keywords that represent, uh, um, how do you say, uh, the behavior of code, so loops, uh, uh, conditions, and so on. Uh, I forgot the, the word now. Anyway, so with this approach, basically we take the array vehicles. First of all, we filter for what is really interesting to us. How can we filter the array? We need to pass a callback that actually returns true for what is interesting for us, okay? So that's a callback. V or E or whatever letter you like is your parameter of your callback. V, v dot type equal to SUV. If it's equal to SUV, we keep it, or we don't keep it if it's not equal to SUV. So the, the, f the filter will create a new array and will drop everything which has the property type not equal to SUV. And then we got all the SUVs, right? But we have objects. We cannot uh, just compute uh, the, the, the sum of objects, right? So let's extract the price from the objects. So let's come out with an array that is an array of numbers, not of objects. How can we do this? Well, remember before, we have squares, we need uh, circles, right? So we have objects, we need numbers. So with the map, we take each element, and from the element, we take out the price. So the return value here is a number, price, because the property of the objects is a number, okay? So here, after the map, we will end up having a, a, an array which has all the prices, so only the numbers that represent the prices of all the SUVs. And then, and then we need to sum everything, actually reduce everything to the average, right? Well, let's start reducing it to the sum, which is easier, okay? So we pass a callback that makes the sum. So the sum, that's the accumulator. In the beginning, that's zero. Second parameter of the reduce, starting value of the accumulator, zero. And then there's the value of the array, price, and we do sum plus price. That could be the return value. But then in the end, we need to say slash 
average, right? Uh, so, sorry, slash the, the length of the array to compute the average. Where's the length of the array? Well, actually, the length of the array is somehow embedded here. We lost it, right? Because it's not the length of the original array, because there are no, uh, not all SUFs. So either we reprocess the array, or we, we find a way to access the length of the array. What is the way? You remember those optional parameters. The third one was the index in the array, and the fourth one was the array itself, so the reference to the array. That's actually very useful, because we can simply ignore the third, so the i, the index, we don't need the index. We need the array because we want to say array dot length, right? And instead do, of doing the division at the end, we just divided each time the price when we add it, okay? So in the end, it's already divided by the length, right? That's a bit of a trick here, but you will see it works, okay? So. I understand that the reduce is more complex. I'm not expecting to see so many reduce inside your code when you are coming to the exam. Okay, but, but actually I expect to see a lot of filters and maps because they are very, very useful. You know, there's a web application, there's a list of things that the user clicks and you want to filter, so uh, keep something out, uh, put something in, transform something, and so on. So filter and map are very useful. Reduce a bit less in a certain sense, but we would like to have a complete uh, discussion, let's say. Let's try this example, okay, and then we will uh, make, um, have a break. Yes, that's a, a question. The i, the i is the index in the array. So the reduce is iterating over the array returned by the map, okay? The i is the index, so the first time the callback is called is zero. Second time is one, third, third time is two, and so on. And it depends on how, how long is the, um, the array coming out from the map. We actually don't know. But we need to specify this i because the array is the fourth parameter. We cannot simply say array and the JavaScript uh, magically knows that we would like to have the array and not the i. They are not named the parameters. They are positional parameters. So if we go back to the reduce, you see the signature of the callback. First, it's the accumulator. Second, current value. Third, the index at fourth, the array. So the third is always the index. We just, yeah. Why don't we, for we don't divide for index because this value changes every, every time. First time is zero, so it will give us an error. The second time is one, third time is two. We need to div uh, divide by the length of the array. That is actually what we would do at the end. This is just a trick uh, because outside the callback, we would not have the length available. So instead of summing everything and then divided at the end, we sum all single elements, each one divided by the length. So in the end, the result mathematically is the same, but so we can do it inside the callback uh, instead of outside, okay? Okay, let's try, thank you for the question. Let's try the example in Visual Studio Code, which I didn't open it yet. It works also in the Python tutor, even though it's probably the limit for the complexity. Uh, Visual Studio Code. Actually, ha always have a look at the files uh, for uh, our lectures. Uh, where are the files? Okay, so in the examples, uh, if the network assists me, uh, lecture examples, you'll always find, find files, you get week number two, maybe I can send you uh, a telegram when I upload some. So this example is already there, okay, so you don't have to type everything, okay. But at least we can explore it with the Visual Studio and play, play a little bit with it. So uh, open the folder, which folder is it? Oh, AWWIC, I forgot to pull it. It's better I pull it before the lecture, sorry. AWWIC, you can do it in Visual Studio as well, but 
Let's hope uh, it works. <sighs> Come on. The network is not so fast. No. Open. Let's hope the computer doesn't get stuck. Okay. <sighs> Why doesn't help? So, code. For some reason the menu was uh, blocked. Anyway, folder. Okay. Week, uh, week two. Uh, don't save it. So we get the example, right? The same thing you can you could do. So how do we test it? And then we play a little bit and then we break. So same way as uh, as uh, last week. Node, uh, what's the name? Example bakers, right? Just prints the the result, right? But let's break things down, okay? Oops, no, what was the window about? So let's say that's not the average SUV price, but it's uh, the list of prices, right? So uh, price list. So let's say const price list. And let's say console log price list so we are sort of debugging things so I broke uh, the, the code into two instructions just to show you what's uh, what's in the middle of the operations right well formatting could be better uh, format okay So you see the price list. So after the map, before the reduce. That's the price list. We have uh, five values. I hope it's correct. Uh, SUV, uh, this. yeah, there are five, uh, five SUVs, okay? And that's uh, the result of the map. It's a new array with, with numbers, okay? Um, <coughs> And then we have this reduce uh, that uh, performs the, the sum. Sum and the average, okay? So we could have, uh, if we break here, so we know the length of the price list because we have price list dot length, right? So we can write the reduce in a simpler way, okay? So let's say you are, you are in the beginning and you're not so familiar with the reduce, you would like to write something simpler, like the example I did in the slides, okay? So let's try to compute a simple sum, okay? Let's say sum, okay? And then we have const uh, average surprise, sum, so price divided by price list dot length, right? So let's try again. Always try. So the result is actually the same. If you want to write a simple reduce, you can write a simpler reduce. You just need the sum, the price, and the, mm, the start value that's zero. But then you need this length. And to get this length, you need to have the result of the map because you need to call uh, the result of the map, so the reference to the array, dot length to get the length, right? Otherwise, you need to write a filter again <laughs> and so on, okay? So uh, this is just to show you different ways of, uh, you know, elaborating on the same code. We can also, since we have a bit of time, we can also try to execute it uh, step by step. Okay, so we'll have a look at the debugger. It's not really needed. I mean, typically, you won't need to debug that much in Visual Studio Code, except maybe in the beginning, you want to understand how things work. But then when you are in a complex web application, typically you use these console logs and stuff because it's easier, you know, than debugging a web application. Okay, 
But in any case, let's, let's have a, give it a try. So how do you debug a program? You go here, run and debug. Let's see. OK. Uh, no. What's the way? I hope I remember correct. Let's start debugging. I think the first time should ask. No. Should ask. Uh, no. Uh, so it's this, this way. I, I must. Yeah. I must say, I tested it on the other computer. If it doesn't work, I will, I will show it after the break. But. Uh, Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, the bug console. No, that's the bug console. Ah, I should have tried before. Sorry, guys. Um, let's put a break. So if you click uh, here, yeah, you are the breakpoint means that the the program should stop. Let's say. Uh, no, run current file, maybe. Okay, we got it right. Sorry. I tested it on the other computer, but then the recording doesn't work, and so I had to fall back to this computer. Anyway. Well, let's say playing a little bit with... <laughs> not <laughs> at a certain point, you are able to debug the program. Now, the program is stopped here on the console log price list, so it, it doesn't print anything. But it, as in any debugger, you can uh, have a look at the variables inside, right? So you have, uh, well, uh, uh, many things, uh, but uh, you have uh, the price list, you see? The price list is an array, and that's a content. And then you have a console log, so you will print the content. But you can expect the content of the array, right? As you can expect the content of vehicles. So vehicles is a more complex variable, so there are 10 elements. And of course, you need to open uh, them to see what's inside, OK? There are many extra things we will not discuss, uh, never discuss, actually, in the course. But uh, um, you know, just think in terms of uh, uh, what is useful for you, OK? So you would like to see what's inside the, the price list. Here you can without the console log. And then, of course, you can step. You will get the print. And then uh, you will uh, do the reduce, I think. You can step into the reduce. And execute the callback since it's synchronous, it's easy because since the callback is synchronous, it will be executed at every loop. So you'll see that the callback is executed. Okay? So you see the lo local variables. These are the local variables of the callback. Okay? Sum, price, and uh, well, th this is undefined. Okay? Fine. And this is the call stack, the one that we saw last time when discussing that this, actually, the call stack actually exists. It's also shown by the debugger. And then you can step and do the computation. So the return value is 24,000 and so on. Go on. And then you pass to the next iteration. You cannot really see the iteration because re we remove the i, right? So I should rerun with the i. I'll do it in a, in a minute. But you'll see the sum, that's the accumulator, and that's the new price. And then the return value is the sum. OK? And then it will go on and on, so five times. Uh, right? And in the end, OK. In the end, we'll get a sum right? that we will print as well. OK? Let's have a look at the i. Right, that's a third parameter, the question I got before. So stop and execute the program again. OK. Uh, OK, let's go the next instruction. And then let's step into, into the callback. OK. You see the i. The i is now here, because it's a local variable. It's in the scope of the callback function. 
Okay? Who called the callback function? Well, the callback function has been called by the reduce. Okay? We called the reduce, but then the reduce called our callback function. And if you go on, you'll see that uh, the i will increase. It will become 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5. And of course, if you need it, uh, you can use it. Okay? We are simply ignore the value. That's why the Visual Studio prints it in, uh, in gray instead of black. Okay? But this is not really important. Okay? So I think it's quite interesting to have a look at this example and try to make sense of this example. That's basically the basic of uh, functional programming, okay? And it's not really important to do this kind of computation. Of course, we can solve it with a for and then an if, uh, no problem. But we will write a lot of code like this in the web application when we need to filter elements in the page, in the web page, okay? Because there's a filter which already returns an array of objects and there's a map from which we can extract what we need from the object and use it, okay? Okay, I, I would break here if there are no questions. Let's say 10 minutes break and um, we'll resume uh, continuing the discussion you know, with the next uh, topic, which is asynchronous programming, really the basic and then the rest, okay. Ah, we should stop the recording.